Okay, EFL weekend recap time on the show today. Are Leeds amazing or are Coventry terrible? <laughs> Why Wayne Rooney's Plymouth Argyle are at the heart of a football culture war. Steve Bruce, football genius. That's not a question, that's a statement. Birmingham's six wins in a row. A manager leaves a club in League One for one in the division below. And Gills and Walsall make it three wins in a row. So, so, so many other bits and more over the next hour and a half on Not The Top 20. Um, and we're going to start in the Championship with some three goal wins. One of them secured by Leeds United, beating Coventry 3-0, George, in a game <coughs> that was quite simply one-way traffic. I mean, it was one-way traffic until the game was over and then Coventry came into it a little bit towards the end. Um, but realistically, this was a complete a complete mismatch between two sides who probably shouldn't be uh, miles apart in terms of where they are both when you look at their performances for for, for last season, but then also the, the quality at disposal for both managers and also the, the success we've seen from Mark Robbins as well. Coventry are confusing at the moment where... You know, nominally, yes, of course, you know, Callum O'Hare, for example, has moved on, um, which is a blow, but he was injured for a long time and they were pretty good without him and that didn't seem to matter too much. They've still got Hadji Wright, who hasn't looked in the same scintillating form apart from the game against Oxford this season. They've still got Ellis Sims. They've still got a lot of quality within their side. I mean, Ben Sheaf is the, is the obvious one where the injury to him, and I think we're now, we're now seeing how important he was for the control that Coventry were able to to have a midfield um, because his absence seems to have hurt them a lot but even so for Coventry to go to Leeds and basically fail to register as an attacking threat for 75 minutes and be 3-0 down is, is a big concern what I will say and what I keep saying I think every week is that Leeds are just incredibly good and I, I'm still very much of the belief that Leeds are the best team in the league and will unless things transpire against them or they're unlucky or whatever like I'd be really surprised if they didn't win the league this yeah. season and I think be... that's four wins to nil already this season yes the games at a point you made on our betting show last week the games that they have failed to win in the championship this season were a chaotic three or draw against Portsmouth on opening day that was just one of those days wasn't it where everything seemed to fly in for, for Pompey um, a one nil defeat against Burnley where again Leeds dominated on balance of play and conceded a breakaway goal and, and kind of huffed and puffed but didn't blow the Burnley house down. Um, and then a, a nil draw against a West Brom side who are, who are an absolutely excellent team. So it, it feels like we are, and you in particular, still incredibly bullish on Leeds being a really strong side. I noted in this game how bright and exciting that front four looks. And we should remember that three quarters of that front four are new players this season from Joseph up top who's come in and made the number nine spot his own and, and looks really great in a number of different ways. Um, from Brendan Aronson, who's, you know, I think now been forgiven for previous transgressions uh, and, and is a nice fit as well. Nyonto, who's excellent and was excellent here, is such an effective attacking player in so many different ways. And then Ramazani as well, who's, who's new on the scene, who's probably going to take a little longer to adapt, but in flashes is showing great speed, great skill, plenty of, of exciting signs. So I, I think... That front four is, is something to get excited about. The, the only downside for Leeds was an injury to Ethan Ampadu in the first half. Nancy Froston of The Athletic reporting that he'll be out for up to 10 weeks. Now, he is quite simply one of the best footballers in this division, both as a defensive player and as someone that gives them so much in build-up. So that is a massive loss for them. They obviously have um, players like um, Tanaka, who came on for him, who will now be able to prove himself having joined over the summer. But really exciting, I think, for Leeds at the moment um, with Firpo and Bogle, the, the fullbacks, both so attack minded. You know, there are times where you're watching the highlights, they've got six in the front line, basically. Uh, and I think that's a, a real bit of fun that they managed to, even with that, make sure that they weren't getting, you know, uh, threatened on the break as well. So issues for, for Coventry. I listened to the square ball this morning and they made the point that, they keep saying, how bad were the oppo today? Like, what, what a surprisingly poor team. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, after half a dozen of those, you start to wonder whether it's more down to, to how good Leeds are at it, kind of basically taking control of, of football matches. Um, do you have any any particular hot takes on what's up with commentary? Um, some Cov fans asking pretty strong questions of manager Mark Robbins. He's someone that we consider to basically be an EFL managerial god. So I can't imagine it will be hugely quick to criticise, but then maybe maybe we're missing something. It's, it's I think, really hard to say from the outside. Um, they've got two home games this week, Blackburn and Sheffield Wednesday. 
And I think it's a massive week. Yeah, I, I agree that it's a big week. I mean, I, I would... With Robbins, I don't really see how someone can be the architect for, uh, you know, over half a decade of consistent progress out of League Two up into the, you know, a penalty kick away from the, the Premier League and then suddenly be the problem. Like, I, I don't think that's how football works. That's not to say that if Coventry did part company with him, they wouldn't maybe bring in another manager who would take them, who kick them on. But it seems just a very simple quite basic way of, of of looking at a football club and their lack of results and just pointing this, the finger squarely at the manager when I think he's proven over time that he has a pretty good grip of the squads and is able to, to improve them so I wouldn't I wouldn't I personally wouldn't worry too much about him it's almost like the constant progression that they've had under him means that once the trajectory looks like it's not going up at all yeah then panic sets. Yeah, in. yeah. But exactly. you have to realise that there's a reason why expectations were so much higher yeah. this season. Like I think so long as Coventry are, you know, if, if they're staring down the barrel of a relegation at the turn of the at the turn of the year, then that's probably when you think we need to change something here. And and I do think you know, football is pretty cyclical and sometimes managers come to a, a, a point in their career at a at a club where it gets stale. And that can be when it's time to, to pull the plug. It, it feels strange that that would happen now with Robbins and, and Coventry, um, especially given the, the quality of the players at his disposal. You know, Sheaf did start this game. It's his first start of the season, uh, playing an hour. And even though, you know, they didn't see the, the fruits of that within the game, uh, you have to think that his return to the side will be a massive benefit to Robbins and, and to Coventry. So I think we'd, we'd want to afford him the luxury of being able to, to welcome back a player who, I think between now and the end of his career, we'll play most of that at, at the top level rather than the championship. So, I mean, uh, away at Leeds, I would say is the worst possible time to analyse um, or, or to, to kind of have a knee-jerk moment to, to look at what's going on with the team because uh, I think Leeds at home will dominate most sides. And even, for example, the three-all draw against Pompey mm. in terms of actual chance creation and, and the way the game went itself... There weren't massive differences. Like it was still fairly one-way traffic. Pompey were just very, very good at taking their chances when the when the few of them came. So I, I think it's yeah, as you say, two home games in a week. Uh, just I think Coventry fans have to retain the faith in Robbins that he will be able to elevate their, their performance level to a level that will get them back winning games of football. Because you know quite clearly right now they're they're a long way off it. The numbers are all right. And mm. sometimes that can be obscured earlier in the season. There's lots of reasons why numbers being all right doesn't necessarily mean everything's all right. Um, but it certainly helps uh, if the numbers were horrendous, then I think there'd be mm. you know, panic buttons flashing maybe a little stronger on my um, football dashboard. Um, <laughs> Hull City beat Cardiff 4-1. Back-to-back wins for Tim Walter's Tigers. Uh, following up their 3-1 win at Stoke last weekend with a 4-1 victory here from behind as well. Callum Robinson scampering clear to put Cardiff ahead. Hull's high line being exposed there uh, and a good take it was too. But afterwards, it was just constant Hull quality and constant Hull domination, really. Their equaliser was fortuitous as it was a, a cross from Mo Balumi that curled all the way in. Um, but he proved that he doesn't need fortune to score lovely, lovely goals because he scored a second and it was brilliant. Really nice little run in behind, played through and with the keeper on rushing where some lose their composure, Balumi, 22-year-old uh, Algerian winger that they signed in the summer has clearly got it in space, just scooping it over the goalkeeper. Really, really nice finish. Um, they signed him from Firenze in Portugal where he had a good season last year. He was still playing in, in Algeria until he was 19, so it's a hell of a trajectory the last few years for Mo Balumi, one of so many players signed from from overseas um, into the championship this summer uh, as clubs looked elsewhere and cast their, cast their net much wider to try and find sort of rare quality and good value. Um, we have got a piece coming out on NTT20.com this week, deep diving into um, the nature of EFL recruitment over the summer. So make sure you're signed up. It's going to be free to read on NTT20.com. So do make sure you're signed up if you want to read about that. Um, and my main takeaway from Hull here, George, is that you told me uh, at the start of the season when we had slightly differing perspectives on, on Hull City, you told me to believe that by the time we got to broadly this point of the season, mm -hmm. there would be players in the squad. It wouldn't look thin. They would do the transfer business and they would have a lot of players. And based on their ambition in the transfer market over the last year or two, they'd probably have some good players too. And for the first time this morning, I looked at the bench and I was like, oh yeah, Hull off the bench. Not in their starting eleven. Liam Miller, 
Abu Kamara, Casey Palmer, Xavier Simons, and Steven Alzat. They got Alzat in late, late on, and that could be something special. And then unused, Carl Rushworth, who surely will become the number one at some point. Too good not to be. Ryan Giles on the bench, unused, with Cody Drama currently playing left back. Finn Burns and Mason Burstow as well. So, um, not just because of the, the the two results. It's easy to say that off the back of two wins. We were worried before, Amber, mu- looking much, much stronger now. Um, they did play the worst team in the league at the moment. Cardiff um, obviously sacked Errol Bullet in the end. Uh, Omariza took charge of this game. And look, he kind of went for it. They, they played quite a, an, an attacking style and it, it didn't work very well. They had so many gaps to exploit at the back, which Hull City did. Um, and going forward, other than a little burst at, at 3-1 down and that one Robinson chance, they didn't create very much. So, I mean, Cardiff have, I don't know where they're going to turn next. They're on one point from seven games, which is the joint worst record in the championship after seven games in modern championship history. Uh, Peterborough 2012-13, Wickham 2020-21. The last second tier team to have a minus 15 goal difference at this stage was Birmingham in 1988. Um, the one thing that's worth pointing out is Cardiff have faced the sides that are currently 2nd, 4th, 5th, 8th, 10th, 12th and 13th. So you'd hope there are some easier fixtures on the horizon, but the way that they're playing, that, that doesn't seem particularly important at the moment. Um, when it comes to a new manager for them, intrigued to see where they're going to turn because I, I must admit, given the structure of the club and how difficult I perceive a job it to be, it's tempting to say they need a firefighter, they need a, a strong character and experienced manager probably an old school British type but it's still so early in the season and it's worth pointing at QPR and Sheffield Wednesday from last season when you have this few points at this stage of the season it can seem almost terminal already but it does not have to be and in my opinion it's probably too early in the season to get a firefighter in yeah. just hoping for a little bounce that's more what you do towards the end of the campaign. I think Omar Eats have seems pretty keen to uh, throw his hat in the ring and his, all of his kind of interviews and stuff saying he wants to be a head coach is how he's always seen it and you know I think it would probably make a lot of sense for him if he was able to stake his claim that they would stick with him and, and I think the, the the way that he approached this game and tries to implement a more attacking style like I do feel a little bit sorry for Cardiff where yet again it feels like the pivotal goals in this game for example the overhit cross when they won the up that goes against them even Zambrano's effort at 2-1 when they were kind of trying to get back in the game is just a massively deflected shot that yeah. wrong foots everybody and, go, and kind of squeaks in and a penalty so of the four goals they concede one is a moment of quality and open play and that kind of feels like how it's gone for Cardiff I'm not disagreeing with you about um, their performance itself just you know when you look at the goals um, so you know Schumacher is the bookie's favourite at the moment um, whether there's anything in that or if it's just the obvious one given he was the, the latest championship manager to get sacked we'll, we'll have to see um, but yeah I mean right now it, it looks like it'll be Rita in charge uh, tomorrow night um, in a home game where they'll be desperate to try and get their first win of the season Friday night's game between Argyle and Luton was great fun for the neutral. A 3-1 win for Argyle, a brilliant atmosphere as it so often is under the lights at home park on these big games, big occasions. I absolutely loved this. I, I'm, it, it's, it's often that I'm reminded how great championship football is uh, and this was one of those moments 10 p.m on a friday night i was just sitting there with a big grin on my face because i'd really enjoyed the game um it was one of those where argyle fans are thinking we're absolute class having won that and luton fans are thinking how on earth have we lost that game 3-1 and i think both are like legitimate takes <laughs> yes. somehow like argyle's attack did look brilliant they did look notably classier better more dangerous than they had done this season and you can't look past the first league start for Rami al Haj as being a big reason for this. Playing in the number 10 role in the 4-2-3-1, scoring a brilliant goal early on with his first shot straight into the top corner, almost scoring a second quite soon after that, a great save by the Luton keeper, Kaminsky. He just made the whole team look better because I think partly because he he reduced some of the pressure on the wide players to create things basically themselves in terms of their 1v1 quality. So reducing the pressure on Whitaker and Obafemi, who started out left, but Sissoko, who obviously came on and is often starting out left. Because al Haj can also receive the ball high up the pitch, back to goal, in tight areas, and he's comfortable like that, 
you, you now defending against him, you don't just have to worry about the wide forwards. And it's really exciting. It's really, really exciting. He played excellently and they did look really fun going forward. I mean, having Sissoko coming off the bench, obviously scoring two great goals, giving one of my favourite post-match interviews I've seen for a while where he was just loving life and why not? Um, there was a lot to, to like for sure. Al Haj, uh, you know, a bit like Balumi we spoke about just before, um, signed from uh, Odense over the summer. Clubs again, particularly for attacking talent, it feels like, trying to look outside the UK, not seeing there being value plus quality together in the English market. Uh, and, you know, such early days, but looks like a, a really good addition for Argyle in, in an area of the pitch where they needed that. And they did defend their box well. Luton had 15 corners. We thought that'd be an area where they could really hurt Argyle, but... Gibson in particular, I thought was brilliant at the back. It's also true that Luton were very wasteful here. Uh, Adebayo is is very visibly lacking confidence in front of goal and it's very tough to watch because he's still getting loads of chances. He's not going missing. He's not hiding at all. He's just getting them and missing them. Um, but there, there's there's issues with Luton at the moment. They're just not at it. They're, they're a beat slow in the press. They're not the physically tenacious um, ball-winning team that that maybe uh, they had developed an identity for being before their promotion. And although they created a fair few opportunities, there still feels like there's something lacking in terms of like a really coherent attacking plan. Um, but it was a great game. It was a great game. And what I've realised, George, is that with, with Rooney as our guy manager, we have, and I don't know if this is the right term, but it's 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 a it's an emotive term. We have what I think is basically like a championship um, culture war. And by that I mean we are going to be having the same conversations about Wayne Rooney's Plymouth Argyle every weekend and the only thing that changes what the conversation looks like is whether they lose or whether they win. Right? Mm. So when they lose, everyone's out of the woodwork to say, we told you so, he's rubbish, he's not good enough, it was a stupid appointment. And when they win, understandably, there's then a strong counter lash to that from the people who are like, this is unfair because... (laughs) With this whole thing, there's no time to breathe. There's no time to like build anything. You're either you're either terrible, or you're going to have to win straight away. Uh, but I would say that Argyle's performances in isolation now are enough that those who basically thought that Wayne Rooney was a joke figure and like his appointment at Argyle guaranteed relegation or whatever else look silly, even if they now. I don't think they think that yet. No, I, but I agree. That's, that's that's fine. But like, even though you know, I'm not saying the ghost of opening weekend has a has a long tail. For sure, it's a long tailed ghost. But it's you know, quite clearly, if you watch that game um, against Luton and, and other performances in the last couple of weeks, there are clear there's a clear capability, especially in terms of attacking patterns, that suggests that he has got this team, or him and and his coaching staff have this team well drilled and motivated. And that doesn't, you know, even if they, they go on and put in poor performance, that doesn't erase uh, the, the Luton game. I think it's more about, with the Rooney debate, this isn't a conversation about a normal manager where it's like, is he any good? He might not be great. It is. It was more, he is terrible. He is bad. Like, he's not good at his job. He's destructive. They're crazy for appointing him. That was the level of, like, uh, outrage about his appointment from neutrals. That, you know, even if he isn't very good, and even if they get relegated and he's sacked or whatever else, I think, you know, if every performance had been like Wednesday on opening day, that's the level of, I think, the expected level of rubbishness that people thought was going to come. And clearly, it's not the case. There, there seems to be a level of, of competence there. Yeah. He seems to have won over the fan base. He's winning games of football in the championship against newly relegated sides. You I, know? Think, I think he's got quite a good temperament for this situation. Yeah. Because he has spent his whole adult life and quite a large part of his childhood as well under so much pressure and scrutiny yeah it doesn't look like it's actually affecting him as much as you could imagine it affecting yeah pretty much any other manager yeah. um there are also i think it's fair to say plenty of fair questions i think about how argyle have started the season as you say they have looked very good in attack i think there are some real concerns defensively and even in this game Although I, although I made the point that they defended their box very well, particularly from set pieces, I'm not sure the defensive structure is filling me with much confidence in general. And it's partly down to the style. Rooney wants to defend by attacking, basically. That's exciting. The games are going to be great to watch. But, you know, if there's a team that is really sharp and executing in the final third that plays that match on Friday night, then I wouldn't be surprised if Argyle had also conceded three as well as scoring three. So I think there are fair questions. that Their two goalkeepers, Connor Hazard and, and Daniel Grimshaw, 
have basically the best shot stopping stats in the league after what are we seven games and that you know there were things like even when they were trying to defend a lead quite simple balls over the top were still seeming to get to the feet of Luton wide players like th- there's there's plenty to look at defensively and improve defensively but who cares that was great fun and I like Argyle being a fun championship team and I think it's it's not it, it kind of probably notable for them how much their profile has been raised as a championship club by the appointment of Wayne Rooney I don't know whether that is a, a happy consequence or not I, I think probably a little bit of both but you have to say it is it is undeniable at this point um, and that was a great win for them uh, a couple more impressive winners George how about Blackburn Rovers beating QPR 2-0 which means they are still unbeaten we're down to three Sheffield United Blackburn and Birmingham uh, all gunning for longest unbeaten run to start the season it's it's interesting that those are the three, isn't it? Because you think of Birmingham, a, a, an obvious one that would have been on most people's list had he been made to guess three. Sheffield United, I would say not, despite being a relegated side, because the perception was that things weren't necessarily all okay. Mm-hmm. But Blackburn were a team that I think a lot of people had marked down to struggle. Mm-hmm. And I think the the work that John Eustace has done and is doing at Blackburn Rovers is remarkable. Like if you, you, know, you, you look at the 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 fanfare and Marty Cifuentes, the the manager that he beat here, albeit with the you know with the help of QPR going down to ten men for a rash challenge uh, from Varane, um, but you look at the the fanfare and Cifuentes, you look at the Danny Royal at, um, at Sheffield Wednesday as well. Like I, if you're a Blackburn fan right now, I, I don't think you'd swap Eustace for basically any manager in the EFL. I think he's doing an absolutely unbelievable job of, of creating just a, a team that are always in games, a really solid defensively and a, a, a good attacking side. Like here, um, the red card came just after half time and it didn't take them long to to kind of click into gear, scoring two really good goals. Travis uh, with the first, with a, a kind of a, an effort from from distance and then Danny back getting, getting the second and they kind of coasted through the game very simply without conceding much. Like it feels that they're so well drilled, they're so consistent. Like Blackburn Rovers putting in a, a poor display just feels I don't understand why it would happen I don't understand how it would happen because um, because they're so solid so you know it feels like Rovers are going to be the team this season where because they've started so fast it will it will be forgotten just how pessimistic many people were about their chances this season and what this season had in store for them with loads you know a lot of people thought they were going to get sucked into another relegation battle especially after Smolik's goals last season probably being the reason why they're still playing in the championship Mm -hmm. so yeah incredible um for them, this was just a, a fairly regulation a 2-0 win off the back of a first half where very little happened, um, thanks to having a, a a numerical advantage for the second half. Dolan, absolutely masterful. Uh, in, in transition, as he has been all season, just the perfect player for this Eustace system and the way that, that Blackburn attack with such speed. Um, Dolan's ability to carry the ball forward, keeping it under very close control and drifting past defenders and then making the final pass as well is, is really impressive. And Todd Cantwell getting lots of plaudits mm. as well for his performance here. Four home wins to start the season for Rovers. Happy days. Uh, Norwich got an away win at Derby. This was a 3-2 uh, for the Canaries with a hat-trick from Borja Sainz, whose finishing was absolutely on it, including a really, really cute little back finish, which ordinarily would be what you would talk about for the 1-0 goal. Uh, instead... Shrouded in controversy. It is ridiculous. This, as in, it's just the fact that it happened twice in the game is just absolutely madness. Yeah, ball was out of play, and um, the ball, ball didn't was, get called as such. The first one it was it was definitely very far out of play, yeah. right? And it was and the the it was the cross from Sergeant where the ball was out of play that went to Sainz. the assist. Yeah, the, the assist. Exactly. The second was one was not nearly as. But, like, I, but I'm also it's not, like a minute between that happening. Well, like, it's literally back to front. Like as soon as the other one, for those who haven't <laughs> seen, the ball goes out of play again, uh, but this time at the other end. So effectively, when Norwich are, uh, are defending, and then from that phase of play, they got the other end, and it's suddenly three on two, and Saints again a brilliant ball from Sargent for the assist. Um, yeah, I'd be pretty it. angry if I was a Derby fan. Yeah, um, Paul One did a masterful job in the post-match he's, he's very good at, at just not bothering to get involved with too much slagging off of refs even when there's quite good reason for it there are some managers who bring up refs even when they haven't done anything wrong yeah, as yeah. a way of, of deflecting um, he didn't do that he, he, he actually seemed really pleased Warren basically about what he perceives to be a really strong connection at the moment between the fan base and the team and he made the point of saying even when we were 3-1 down like 
the stadium was still full. They were still getting behind the team. And, you know, for, for a manager like him, who is very, you know, he leads with his emotions. I think that's a, a really great scenario for them to be in. And I think, you know, this performance probably wasn't their best of the season at home, but they still caused Norwich quite a few problems. They're still really, really looking very good in midfield, I think. And OK at the back, I think a bit hit and miss going forward here. Um, lots to be unhappy about with the um, with the linesmaning decisions, but even so. Also, there was the consolation goal from Derby um, through Blackett Taylor is some of the worst defending I think I've ever seen in yeah. my whole life. Tired. Where he's just he's just on the ball, just like just kind of walking in on the outside, cuts into his right and fires it in. You're thinking, defenders, where are you? Um, I almost ended up looking like a bit of a genius. Okay, where amazing. Fot Mob Corner last week talked about Norwich, talked about the new Norwich, talked about uh, Jose Cordoba. Yeah. And I mentioned that as good as his debut was, what I had noticed is that he's very physical with his defending, mm-hmm. and there might be times where referees don't let him off with that. And again, here, there was a, a penalty incident where Derby thought they should have had one. And like, I think it would have been a soft penalty, um, but. He's got his arms on the on the attacker's shoulders. He's being like really physical and and you know taking touch tight a, a touch too far. Um, and again, if he keeps doing that, like there will be refs that that don't have such a high threshold for for penalties. So um, something to be to be careful of. But a, a great win for for Norwich. And you know to finish on a positive, masterful finishing from Sainz, just fantastic. Um, and he's in in rare form at the moment. And with Sargent playing really well in all assets all aspects apart from his finishing at the moment. Um, I think it's it's nice for Norwich to have uh, other goal threats so they don't have to rely on Captain America. Uh, Norwich v Leeds is probably, for me, the big one on Tuesday night in the Championship. And that is particularly notable because it's gonna be the first episode of Under the Lights, which is our new podcast, which is covering all sets of midweek fixtures this season in the EFL. For, for years, one of the big knocks on our coverage of the EFL from our audience was you don't do enough for midweek games and it was true it hurt more because it was true and it, there are lots of excuses for it there's lots of reasons that it's difficult to do or there's not much time to do it and it's hard and you have to stay up late or get up early whatever it is we've forgotten all that we're doing this this season under the lights a midweek fixtures show it'll go out on wednesday lunch times and it's going to be for the paid subscribers of ntt20.com so if you want basically Monday pod analysis of midweek EFL games, you will have to be a paid subscriber of NTT20.com. And if you will become that this week, thank you in advance. Thank you for your support. But that is not for charity. You will get at least one, sometimes two podcasts a week extra that you can listen to and at least two written pieces as well. And I promise you that the quality will be impressive and you will enjoy being a paid subscriber of NTT20.com. Which did you prefer? Millwall 3, Preston (coughs) 1. Or Middlesbrough two Stoke nil. Millwall three Preston one because Millwall are a team that I am having to change my opinion of them very very quickly. Having been pretty concerned by them to start the season, their recent performance levels have been really good, and they suddenly feel like having been a uh, not a um. I, I know the results; it's only their second win of the season, but it feels like they're suddenly a very good cohesive unit who. Again, like don't don't concede too much by way of uh, you know their defensive work is good, but suddenly you have loads of threats. Uh, and you look at the the game uh, here against Preston. Preston obviously not really enjoying life at the moment under Paul Heckingbottom. Um, but George Honeyman getting the first. Um, Sa, who is a, a player that I think we can we expect to. You know, we were told this time last year by a teammate of his that he was a very exciting young player. Um, It feels to me like the way that Neil Harris has um, Millwall playing at the moment means that Essay is someone who we should see a lot more of and it was a a, a brilliant assist for the, uh, for his goal, I think from Watmore, wasn't it? And then, uh, and then Langstaff getting his first goal for the club as well with the kind of poachers finish that we, you know, that they are the goal, the chances he's going to need if he's going to score goals. So, all three goals are kind of very varying in different ways, uh, looking very lively. No reliance on Watmore for the goals, which is what we've seen previously. One of the weirdest sending offs you're ever going to see uh, late in the game with um, the youngster Amaku coming on, basically being booked for diving and then the protestations from the North End players. He reacted badly to it and basically got two yeah. yellow cards. Young Irishman up against seconds. a veteran Irishman, Robbie Brady. Yeah. Amaku, uh, who has never played for the senior team yet, but does have... 10 Republic of Ireland under 21 caps. I feel like basically 
taking on, I was going to say attacking, but that is so over the top, <laughs> taking on Squaring someone to, like Robbie yeah. Brady, who has provided one, certainly one of uh, the great modern era moments for his nation and has 66 caps. Probably wasn't the smartest thing for a Maku to do. But if you look at, yeah, I mean, just quickly on Millwall, this season, so the season as a whole, they are, according to FootMob, second for expected goals, 13.2. They are top for big chances created on 24, top for big chances missed at 14, which kind of tells its own story. Like they are, from, a, from an attacking point of view, they are doing really, really well, mm. like from a chance creation point of view. And, I, and I, I strongly think that they are a team who, if they maintain this level, uh, could surprise a few people. Yeah, looking really dynamic at the moment. Um, Middlesbrough beat Stoke 2-0, and I think they, they needed this. I think their fans, it was the right time for them for the team and the, I guess the manager by extension to remind Borough fans that they are a good team. I think like they, they sort of know that, but God, it's frustrating, isn't it? How often that they've, they've kind of underwhelmed in terms of performances. Um, this was a good reminder that they can be dominant at this level, particularly at home. And that's what they were against a Stoke team that, that looked a bit muddled and a bit uncertain. Um, ben Doak winning the battle of the Liverpool loanies uh, with young Kumas, on the Stoke side and Doak on the Borough side. Uh, Kumas gave away a free kick in the first half and it was taken quickly. McGree's shot was saved into the path of Doak who scored uh, his first goal and looked very lively. The second goal was an absolute beauty from Hayden Hackney. And with Hackney, I think there's, because he's been around now for, it's coming into his third sort of full season, isn't it? Or not quite full season when he burst onto the scene. That was like October, November time. Because... For us, it feels like we've been talking about Hackney now pretty constantly for like 18 months. feels like in the last month or two, it's been more fashionable to talk about Aidan Morris or yeah. to talk about other players. But like he is a remarkable player, Hackney, and still such a young player. I saw him play for the England under-21s two weeks ago. I mean, he, he doesn't play like an under-21 player, but he's still eligible for England under-21s, which is crazy. He's making among the most passes of any midfielders in the league. He's constantly playing forward. He doesn't play safe. He is a progressor. And to me, he looks a bit bigger and a bit stronger I thought that as, as well. well. Yeah. I, like when I saw his goal, I was like, I don't think that's happening. No, I agree. I think that's someone else. So we're seeing physical development as well, which has got to be a good thing for him um, in terms of, of like the defensive part of the game and um, starting to win a bit more uh, in midfield. Um, great, great goal. Dominant display from, from Middlesbrough. And, you know, it should be worth mentioning that Luke Ayling had to play centre-back here. They've got four senior centre-backs out injured at the moment. So impressive to get the um, the, the, the clean sheet. Um, I think, yeah, we all know that they're a team with a high ceiling borough. That is, there's no doubt about that at this moment. But so far this season, they keep sort of falling through the yep. holes in the floor. And they didn't do that yet. <laughs> Do you want to talk about Sheffield Wednesday 3, West Brom 2, or Watford 2, Sunderland 1? Two good games. Yeah. Uh, I'll go for... I'll take the Wednesday game. Um, he always goes for the first one. I he, don't. Honestly, for years, he makes it look like a big pantomime, like he's got to really weigh it up. His brain is so simple that whatever he hears first, he's like, that's what I'm doing. Do you, do you reckon that I do that by mistake? So like, I, I don't consciously do that. Maybe it's just my brain is already on that first yeah. game and it can't jump forward to the other I think one. It, by the way, I think it's completely understandable. Well, Because you hear what I've said and then your brain goes I, like, I oh yeah, I do have something to say about that game. I, I didn't think you were having a go. <laughs> Your brain works in wonderful ways. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, this was a really important game, I think, for kind of for both sides. And that for for Baggies, it's their unbeaten record over. Um, I wouldn't say there was too much to concern them, um, apart from their inability to capitalise on on a comeback because uh, they were behind early on in the game with Darnell Furlong turning uh, the ball into his own net. A Robin Van Persie light goal came next with Famo playing a a straight launch um, over Bartley's head onto Josh Windass's head, who just nodded it over the keeper and lobbed him uh, with a first touch. Like unbelievable finish, fun goal. Yeah. really fun goal, um, and a unique goal, as many people know that I like. Um, and then, as you kind of expect, Baggy's got more and more into the game, got more and more on the ball. Tom Fellow started causing issues and he was the architect for the for the first goal that got them back into it at 2-1. Fellows to Madger, was it? It was Fellows to Madger. Wow, what a surprise. Madger was very hurt off the back of that as well. Yeah. I, I, then I was like, oh my God, he looks like he was really badly I thought, injured. I thought he like Didn't clapped to the off. post. Yeah, it was weird. That was good. Uh, and then Alex Mowat scored a very weird goal where he kind of like, it was like a, a volley 
or he kind of hit a bouncing ball into the ground. I think it must have taken a nick off a, off a, like a, a defender's knee on the way up, and it looped over James Beadle, who couldn't um, divert it. And then you know you're thinking Wednesday two 0 up, Baggy's going to bring it back to two all. You know you're expecting probably the the team who are unbeaten this season, who put in some of the best performances in the league, to to go on if one team is going to do it uh, against a side who are struggling for confidence and for form. But no, uh, Masaba the that scores the winner after just some unbelievable work from Barry Bannon. I can't stress enough just what an incredible season Bannon's having this season, where in my mind, you kind of think now we're getting to a stage where are his powers going to wane? You know, he's now at championship level where his technical ability may not be as elite as it was in League One, where he was quite clearly the best footballer in the league. But I mean, here he makes a really good diagonal run, peeling off off the left-hand side, times it really well, brilliant first touch, and then just finds a, like an inch perfect cross to to Masaba to, to divert home um and given the the goals that Bannon has scored in recent weeks too I mean he's already he's already scored two absolute worldies this season um it is you know he is still doing his bit for, for Wednesday and, and proving quite often to be that little bit of quality in the final third that makes the difference for them and Watford beat Sunderland 2-1 um a kind of fun game this like Watford have just got Quite a fun team, basically, and so I always enjoy watching their games. Um, fun team with Festi Ebersele in it, who's an old friend of ours from uh, 21 under 21 years past. Um, went and spent a bit of time uh, learning Italian culture and now plays for Watford. And he scored at the back post, sort of goal we've seen them score already this season with Ryan Andrews normally at, at right wing back. Basically like, you know, when you've got wing backs like that, if they get really, really high, you do often have that extra man at the back post and um, and it's worked well for them. Uh, Ebersele finishing. For Sunderland, they got back level. Um, there were some really intriguing and I think positive signs from Wilson Isidore playing up front. He missed a chance in the first half and then scored in the second half with quite similar um, chances that came about through similar good bits of movement inside the box. And of course, Mayenda had a good first few games of the season and scored a couple of goals. But even so, what Mayenda is is has not demonstrated yet is like inside the penalty box, poacher's instinct, like Josh Madger type stuff. And that's what Isidore showed here, just in a couple of flashes and need to do it more consistently. Um, but I think that's really you know worth pointing out because if he if he can get a run of games at number nine and if his movement is that good in the box. Um, then, as we saw here, players like Roberts are suddenly going to have a much better target for their uh, cutbacks and crosses. But lost the game, and it was just a bit of head loss, really, from Dan Neal diving in on, on Quadwo Bar. Just never dive in on Quadwo Bar. Yeah. He is such a good ball carrier. Um, even so, if you're going to do it, don't miss time it like this. Um, I think the game was, well, it was one over 10 minutes to go. Sunderland had had the last six shots up to that point, so you'd say possibly looked the more likely to go and win it until the penalty um, scored and Watford winning 2-1. So I think, you know, Lou Orns pointed out some tactical tweaks from Cleverly, um, which I think was clever management from him, trying to make them a little less um, vulnerable on the, on the counter-attack. I like that he corrected himself in his post-match interview. He said that they had some half chances, quarter chances. Quarter chances, I like that. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, a bit more conservative, the, the wing-backs, which I think was smart because Sunderland attacked really well in transition and particularly out wide with Mundell and Roberts. Um, Sissoko having a big game. Ogbonna having a big game as well. Good win for Watford in a, a pretty even game. I, I'm not really, you know, uh, rating Sunderland down too much for this one. And then three draws, Swansea one, Bristol City one was a pretty good watch on Sunday. Um, both goals coming from corners. Cabango for, for Swansea seeing a lot of um, keepers getting blocked off by someone sort of standing right in front of them and then are they fouling them are they not fouling them is the keeper initiating the contact is the attacker initiating the contact we're not really sure but maybe popularised by Arsenal everyone's doing it and some people are getting goals and some opposition teams are getting a bit upset about it that's what happened here Um, I think two things can be true O'Leary was possibly fouled but also could have probably done a bit more in terms of, you know, clearing him out of the way and going and getting the ball rather than just flopping on the ground. Uh, Jason Knight with a, a big captain's thumping header. That was like Roy Keane-esque stuff from him, attacking the front post, heading home the equaliser. Um, in maximum 10 words, Oxford nil, Burnley nil. Happy? A match that happened where Burnley had most of the ball and most of the shots but couldn't really do anything about it. 
brilliant. Um, Pompey nil, Sheffield United nil. I think for, for Portsmouth, good performance, good result. Uh, and for Sheffield United, four clean sheets in a row now for them and obviously extending their, away, uh, their unbeaten record this season. Steve Bruce is the first ever Blackpool manager to win his first four league matches in charge. Bruce is managing at League One level for the first time in over 20 years and duck meat water. It couldn't be going any better. So with the help of our partners FOTMOB on this video, we're going to look at what Bruce has done to turn things around so dramatically. We're going to talk about their best player that I think might be the best player in League One this season. And we're going to finish by asking what happens next and how sustainable is this run of form? George Ellick, what has Steve Bruce done to get Blackpool <clears throat> cooking like this? He's done what every single Blackpool fan wanted Neil Critchley to do <laughs> for the last year. And he's changed the formation and he's changed where, where players are playing. If we look back to the last game under the Critchley era, a 3-0 defeat against Stockport. It was that 3-5-2 that we knew he was always going to play. It was players playing out of position. You had Coulson, who's an attack-minded left-back, playing kind of that higher left-sided role. You had Rob Apter, who'd made you know such an unbelievable season on loan at Tranmere last season, playing right wing, playing as that right wing back, which didn't suit him at all. Basically, players not playing in their best positions and teams are finding it incredibly easy to defend against them. Mm. Bruce came in and... You know, it's almost too perfect. Bruce came in and played 4 4 2, and all the players are playing the positions they want to play. Coulson now that overlapping left back with, with uh, CJ Hamilton playing in front of him. You've got Jordan Gabriel, an attack minded right back, playing on the right hand side with, with Apta now playing further forward, as we saw in the game on Saturday. It's able to, to get on the ball in dangerous areas, beat players, come onto his left, left foot, and, and score goals, uh, as he did with his first goal of the season on Saturday. It, it might seem just too easy and too obvious but there's no doubt that Steve Bruce changing the formation and playing this way a suits the players that he's got mm -hmm. at his disposal and b means that this team is playing at a much higher level than they were previously they seem to be playing with a much better tempo much better energy some of that might just be the freshness the new mentality the the, the desire to show off to your new manager. And there are certain players like Kyle Joseph in particular that looks completely reinvigorated playing for Bruce. We've been constantly told that Bruce as a man manager is fantastic, that players love him, that he is you know that perfect like grandfather figure now as he is in footballing terms with such experience and such history behind him and such an affable personality that really can rub off on players. And Joseph in particular looks brilliant. Interesting to me to see that he's going with really young centre-backs, Casey yeah. and O'Fire. Sometimes with an older manager, you'd think they would want more experience, particularly in the in the central defensive role. Um, but Bruce, an amazing centre-back, of course, as a player, he's got the youngsters under his wing and he, and he wants to show them how to develop, both of them playing brilliantly. But I agree with you, the formation change on one very simple level, it gets Apta and it gets CJ Hamilton into positions that suit them, that allow them to focus on what they're good at, which is attacking with direct with directness and speed and not starting really deep because they've had to form part of a back five out of possession. Um, they definitely look like they're attacking much quicker in transition and the wingers, I think, starting higher up really helps the team attack in, in transition. We can't ignore the fact that the goalkeeper, Harry Tyra, is in absurd stop, shot stopping form and made some good saves against Burton. Um, but Apta is just such an exciting player, and, and the goal that he scored against Burton was brilliant. However, Lee Evans. Levens. Lee Evans, funny man, great footballer. <laughs> I think possibly the standout player in League One so far this season. He has the top rating of all outfield players on FOTMOB, as we are here, what, eight games into the season? He leads League One for assists. He leads League One for chances created. Now, some of those around half are set-piece situations where his delivery is brilliant. But crucially, he is also creating plenty of chances from open play. He has created the most big chances in League One this season. And this isn't like a number 10 whose only job is to create chances. He is a number six. He is also the tempo setter. He is also the midfielder that everything goes through. He leads Blackpool for touches. He leads the league for accurate long passes per 90. Everything runs through Lee Evans. He is their epicentre and he's doing 
everything that you want your midfielder in his position to do because he's not just a technical player with long passing range. He's also strong in the tackle. This is not a lightweight player at all and he showed that in the build-up to his goal on Saturday, winning the ball back and then firing in from range. And it feels like every set of fans that have supported a team that Lee Evans has played for have always loved and appreciated Evans while being devastated that injuries have made it so hard for him over the last decade or so. Only twice in his career has he been able to start more than 26 league games in a season. But this season, he's played every minute for Blackpool, which makes me a bit nervous, to be honest. <laughs> I hope he's maybe he's doing some more stretching, some yoga, some Pilates, whatever. But it's working, whatever he's doing. Fiona on NTT20 Squad, our community of, of EFL fans, said, I think I might be a little bit in love with Lee Evans. I could watch him play forever makes it look so simple. And I completely agree. I think he's up there with the best players in the division right now and is the key cog for Steve Bruce. Because now, George, what do we expect from Blackpool? They started the season <clears throat> poorly. It looked like any promotion aspirations were, 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 were gone. Now it certainly does not look and feel like that. What's realistic and what do you think is their level of performance sustained over the next 10 games or so? I think they are genuinely good. I don't think this is just a new manager bounce off the back of some variants and that's now going to regress back to, to, to a mean. I think their level is high. I think if you look at, you know, you mentioned Tyra, they're making some good saves. And yes, that's true. But actually, if you look at the underlying numbers, they are basically the data darlings. I bet we never thought we'd say that about a Steve Bruce side of, of the league, where for expected goals this season, they rank second with 12.0 according to FOTMOB. Shots on target per game, 5.1 is fourth. Big chances created, 20. Uh, is second in the league, uh, joint second. Big chances missed, third. So again, showing there that even though they're creating the chances, they're still leaving quite a lot on the table. Um, so yeah, I, I think this isn't a case where it's a few good results when performances aren't great. I think from an attacking point of view, they are really, really strong. Maybe defensively, they're still not quite there. But you know, in Bruce, I'd much rather bring see Bruce into a side that needs to tighten up defensively rather than, rather than one that needs to improve uh, going forward. So. I, I'd i be surprised if they're not a team at the very least in the top six come the end of the season. It's not a new manager bounce. Blackpool could be legit, and you heard it here first on Not The Top 20 on FOTMOB Corner. Make sure you download the FOTMOB app. I think you can tell Ali and I both use it quite a lot and absolutely love it for live scores and all the stats you need there too. Uh, you can find the download link in the show notes. Elsewhere in League One, from four wins in a row, in a row. <laughs> Let's leave that in. From four wins in a row Blackpool to six wins in a row Birmingham. <laughs> Three two winners against Peterborough. From two nil down, this game couldn't have started any harder for Birmingham. But frankly, in League One terms, they need a bit of a handicap. And that's what they, they sort of created themselves a two goal uh, handicap here by... Bailey Peacock Farrell being tackled into the net by Ricky J. Jones for 1 0. I thought that was just quickly really good from Ricky J. Jones. Like the anticipation, the speed of thought, the aware, like, and then the execution was just like Bailey Peacock Farrell. That was the equivalent of like a first round knockout in football terms. Yeah. I don't think he had a clue what was going on the whole time. For sure. And suddenly the ball was in the back of the net. Um, and then a set piece header from Big Manny Fernandez put them two up after a quarter of an hour. But it just, and it's easy to say this after the fact, with delicious hindsight. But it, it never felt like Birmingham would, were definitely going to lose, even when they were 2-0 down after 15 minutes, which would be, you know, panic stations for most teams. And they just worked their way back into it. Uh, Williamson finishing well, lovely assist from Hansen down the left-hand side. Then it was an own goal from uh, Oscar Wallin after a Stansfield shot hit him and flew into the top corner. And then eventually, Bielik at the back stick sort of armed it in uh, it, sort of, it looked like a back post header and then on, on closer viewing it definitely wasn't that he just sort of must wrestled it in somehow hit, maybe should, hint of a should hand. it have counted hmm. maybe maybe not but they just very consistently worked their way back into this game I think Posh had one shot from like the 20th minute onwards and it was Poku from 40 yards went nowhere near the goal that they have this amazing this this perfect footballing thing at the moment Birmingham we ignore the money spent ignore all of that stuff the team is playing in a way that its fans is just finding sensational. And the level of noise and volume that the fans are therefore generating to support their team is therefore raising the level of that team. It is a virtuous cycle and it feels 
so amazing when that happens to your team. The fans are so up for it. Uh, Chris saying, maybe it could be nu more nuanced than this, but it almost feels like we're sucking goals in at the moment. The atmosphere when the team attacks and the way the team attacks with complete role clarity, nothing phases us. And it does feel a bit like that. Uh, an unstoppable team seemingly right now. Birmingham with six wins in a row, top of the uh, embryonic league table. On Tuesday night, they're playing against Huddersfield, uh, the two preseason favourites for League One, these two teams, going head-to-head -head on Tuesday night. That game will be covered on Under the Lights, our new podcast covering the midweek games on ntt20.com. For our paid subscribers, uh, a paid subscription is seven quid a month. And with that, you get at least one bonus podcast a week, two when there's midweek fixtures, and at least two written pieces as well with quality and insight and passion at the heart of them. See you there. Oh, I got a bit emotional there. I know. And um, Birmingham, good. You okay? Yeah, Birmingham. I mean, Birmingham managed this incredibly well given the, the difficult position they were put in, or they put themselves in by being 2-0 down. Um, it, was, <clears throat> it, it wasn't the game that I thought it was going to be. Like, Spoiler alert, or not spoiler alert, um, a moment of omission. Like I was I was on a stag doing Lil on Saturday yeah. and therefore I wasn't all over the three o'clock kickoffs as, as I might sometimes be. Mm -hmm. But obviously I knew what was going on. And I must say, when I saw this develop, I agree with you that at 2-0 it doesn't, didn't really feel like it was late enough in the game to be too much of an issue. But when you actually look at the game itself, it was a game of few chances. It was a game mainly played between both boxes and... Birmingham managed to find a way to get over the line without necessarily being, you know, a, a, an overly a creative attacking force. Albeit the, you know, the second goal was a, a deflected Stansfield shot. Um, but the thing I want to point out mainly here is that Chris Davis going in at half time two one down made some really interesting subs. Where you mentioned Hansen got the assists, but he was taken off for Keshi Anderson, and then Lyndon Dykes playing as a target man was taken off for, um, you know. I think the the sub probably a lot of Birmingham fans would have expected him to make was that Dykes would come off for May and May would come on and then they would play that kind of fluid forward line that we saw them play against Wrexham a couple of weeks ago. But it was Scott Wright that came on and then Williamson came in, came inside. And, you know, obviously it worked when you look at the result itself. So um, I always think it's a, you know, firstly, it's indicative of the quality of the squad that Birmingham have got that they're able to make those kind of changes, but also credit to the manager for, you know, if you're going to use the result as the be all and end all for the for the justification of the changes that he made at half time too. Wickham beat Bristol Rovers 2-1 with a late late winner from Joe Lowe. That is notable because one Joe Lowe, Bristol City Academy uh, graduate now scoring not for the first time at the home of Bristol Rovers, uh, but also his dad, Josh Lowe, came through at Bristol Rovers and started his career there. So lots and lots of narrative there, but mainly another Wickham win and that's four in a row now they sorry four wins and one draw since they lost their first two games of the season to Birmingham and to Wrexham I owe Wickham fans a big apology because we didn't talk about your win against Cambridge last week on the show and I felt very bad about that it was entirely due to my incompetence and that as you can imagine hurts no one's a, as big a critic of myself as than myself so you can be sure that that won't happen for a few weeks at least. Um, and, and how impressive to win this game, particularly after having played Aston Villa in the Cup in midweek, you know, took Villa all the way really in that game as well, to, to still have the energy reserves to get over the line here, really, really impressive, especially having gifted Bristol Rovers their opening goal through Scott Sinclair. But it was a, a fantastic equaliser with Morley passing it out wide to Harvey, who found the top corner cutting in, uh, and then Joe Lowe winning it right at the end. Another one of those goals where the keeper's kind of being blocked off, but also like, mate, You've got to find a way. You've yeah. got to bulldoze your way through and clear that ball. Otherwise, teams are going to do this all the time. Wickham are an amazing team this season, George. They have scored two in every single league game. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, they're getting late points with, with late winners, late equalisers. They've got notably good bench options compared to previous Wickham squads, which always used to, you know, ha they had to be small. They had to be tight because they didn't necessarily have the budget. I think it seems like with the new ownership group, they've been able to give Matt Bloomfield a squad of just packed full of senior players and he's making the most of it. Like, here's a list of players that didn't play on Saturday because of either injury or, or not coming off the bench. Kieran Sadlier, Dan Udo, Luke Leahy, Nathan Bishop, Sam Vokes, Brandon Hanlon and Ryan Taffazoli. All senior Wickham players that are not even involved at the moment, um, such as the strength of their squad. So I'm keeping a really close eye on Wickham at the moment to see whether they could be a legitimate 
top six, maybe even automatic promotion contender. They've got Barnsley, Stockport and Peterborough, three of their next four games. I think we will know a bit more about this Wickham side uh, in a few weeks' time. As for Bristol Rovers, what's going on at Bristol Rovers? Why are they so bad? I, I don't really know, um, but they are bad. I mean, I think it's not... With a club like them where there's kind of pre-season optimism, the, the second question is, you know, why are they so bad? But I think the first question is, how bad are they? Because in my mind, it's, it's the answer's kind of terrifyingly bad. Um, definitely, right now, if they don't improve, they're going to be in a relegation battle bad and probably just relegated bad. Um, I, I, it, it's hard to put your finger on why, especially when you've got a manager in Matt Taylor who I think has enough in his body of work to suggest that he's competent at the very least but it, it's funny how they're, they're just very bad defensively and they seem to concede so many different types of goal and can't really uh, it, within games block teams out and that is a concern about Taylor who in the infancy of his managerial career the criticism was always that he was too defensive minded and that his exercise was solid defensively but couldn't really find the the attacking threat so um, I personally wouldn't think it's all down to do, all down to the manager I guess um, some of the individuals they brought in in the summer haven't performed up to the levels that we were anticipating. You know, Promise Omashere, a lot of the goal-scoring burden falling at his feet, uh, and he's struggling to to provide the um, to provide that. So, yeah, I'm I'm really concerned about them right now. I, I think they are um, one of the worst teams in League One. Yeah, worst xG against in the division, and the sixth worst attack in terms of xG generated so far this season. That is a terrible combination for a team that has designs on mid-table or higher. A really, really poor start to the season. You could say the same about Cambridge, who are just struggling. I was going to say treading water at the moment, but it, it doesn't feel like it's even as good as that. They have one point from seven games. They lost 2-0 at home to Lincoln City. They are gifting goals to the opposition, and they did so again here. The first goal was... Pretty embarrassing from a Cambridge point of view, not only giving the ball away again in a bad area in which to do so, but also just trotting back defensively, like not the sort of effort or at least visible effort that you expect to see, that you need to see when you are a club that, that is punching above their weight budget-wise at the level. You know, Makama had two great chances for Lincoln that weren't taken. It was Draper and Kadamatri that scored, which which shows the kind of... the the youthful exuberance that Lincoln have up front with those three players who all offer something physically but also can score goals. Um, they're not creating any chances, Cambridge. Uh, I'm not even sure if they, they know what chance creation is right now. Um, they haven't scored first in a single game this season. They're the only team in the EFL who are yet to um, take the lead in a match this season and it's really poor. On the flip side, we have a Lincoln City side mm. on 14 points from seven games. Um, they are posting top six defensive numbers at this moment in time. Um, zeros and ones in, in five of their seven games so far. Always reliable and good out of possession shape. Not always super fluid and creating tons of chances, but doing enough here thanks to their opposition to, to kind of create chances through their shape, through their press and their physicality. Um, but again, like another team, just to keep a very close eye on in the next month or so to see whether, like Wickham, we're looking at a top six contender here or whether just a, a hot start to the season because they've got Blackpool, Leighton Orient, Wrexham and Birmingham in their next four games. And I think if we look at those four as a chunk in a month's time, we'll know even more about this impressive Lincoln side. Tell me about Crawley nil Bolton 2. If you'd have said to me two weeks ago that one of these teams wouldn't have that manager in charge, I'd have thought you were talking about Ian Everton Bolton. But he's still there. Scott Lindsay <clears throat> is not Crawley manager anymore. No, he's not. He's moved to MK Dons. Um, it seems like all those social media figures who um, deal in EFL manager news are suggesting that Rob Elliott is likely to come in. So... Uh, the current Gateshead manager who took over from Mike Williamson, who left MK Dons, which is the reason why you know it's all it's all got kind of connected, interconnected there. Um, yeah, this was a, it's it's a funny one. This where Dempsey scores after five minutes for Bolton from a from a set piece to put them one nil up, and then Crawley absolutely dominate the ball. Um, but with Bolton being by far and away the more dangerous side of the two, before McAtee scores with a brilliant strike very late on, and. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it feels like a 
a significant move away from the blueprint of Ian Ebert's success with, with, with Bolton, where I would argue that the the main part or like the 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 kind of main trait of their of his team as a you know personality trait in terms of the way that they approach games has been their aggressive pressing and their energy out of possession whereas Crawley completed or Crawley attempted 493 passes in this game to to Bolton's 224 and 210 of those were in Bolton's half so this was a game where especially after they went one up Everett was very happy to just sit off mm. and let Crawley have it comfortable knowing that they maybe didn't have the attacking threat to trouble them too much and that they carried a, a threat on the break um, themselves that, that where they were able to hurt uh, Crawley not to mention they came close a couple of times from other set pieces too so yeah I mean I think this is in, you know, from my, my looking at it as a neutral I think for Everett to who's always been relatively stubborn and we know that his the way he talks in the media is always very very bullish it feels like he's kind of taken on board this start to the season, realised that he's got to maybe mix it up a bit to get results and has done so. So um, credit to Bolton. It's been a, you know, an impressive or an important, I should say, a uh, couple of weeks for them with that 5-2 in over, over Reading as well. And no hangover from the demolition at, at the Emirates um, in, in midweek last week. With Crawley, it's just a case, I guess, of um, wanting to get the new manager in and hope that Lindsay's departure doesn't spell a spiral. Yeah, yeah, they've lost... Probably their best manager of all time, who gave them some of the best times they've ever had. And he's walked out on them for a team in the league below. Perhaps unsurprisingly, there's now an inevitable focus uh, at the sort of feet of the owners and the board. The fact that their manager felt like a team in the league below is a better opportunity for them has to be quite frustrating and confusing. And you can see why, therefore, there'd be the focus on a board that that it wasn't showing him enough ambition and giving giving him the sense that he would be able to take the team forward. Um, so that's the the situation that they found themselves in. Dan, who's a Crawley fan on NTT Twenty Squad, wrote an amazing um, piece or, or yeah, sort of a a, a piece uh, upon Lindsay's departure. And I think the the thing to point out because we've talked about so much about the incredible playoff run that they had under him, the unlikeliness of that promotion, how they proved literally everyone wrong in the most aesthetically brilliant way as well uh dan saying more than enough has been said about how he changed us on the pitch but i really want to hammer home what he's done for us off it 12 of our 20 highest ho home attendance ever have come under Lindsay's tenure and eight of the top 20 away where there'd always been widespread apathy in the town about our club scott has turned us into a team people want to and are proud to back um and uh, and then there was Wembley. For a long time, we've suffered from a tin pot mentality on and off the pitch. We're just a non-league club who shouldn't be here, so we'll be happy to tread water and leave the important stuff to them lot. Trips to Wembley wasn't a thing that happened to teams like us. If you wanted that from football, you'd have to look elsewhere. In Lindsay, we finally had a manager who wanted us to compete for something more than perpetual mediocrity. He made the fans believe, he made the players believe, and we got the greatest day of our lives out of it. And I think the fairly simple measure of the success of a football manager to provide fans with that sort of joy with those memories and not just the individual memories but the desire to go and watch that team every single week at great expense when there are lots of other things that they could be doing as well that is an incredible measure for the success of a managerial tenure and that's what Crawley have now uh, lost Another 2-0 away win was Stags at Cobblers. Mansfield winning 2-0. Northampton had a pen at 0-0. And Tarek Fosu did one of those... So I'm not a anti-stutter Sounds like you guy. are. Sounds like you're about to be. But. but <laughs> right? He did the sort of stutter step that I think only ends up really freaking yourself out. Because Christy Pym didn't move. When yeah. Fosu stopped in his run up. And I think. And then you're like, well, what am I doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. A, oh, God, what am I going to do now? Because he hasn't given me an inkling of which way to go. And B, I've lost all my momentum in my run up. So I'm not going to have much power behind this shot. Uh, Fosu going left, Pim choosing the right way and pushing it to the side. Uh, and then Mansfield um, going ahead. The, the second goal for Mansfield was scored by Aaron Lewis, who has got a proper. Australian so fast good. bowler bowler vibe at the he's, moment. He's he's had some unbelievable looks. <laughs> he's had some unbelievable haircuts. I love it. I think it's great. When he scored that um, viral goal last season, he had like 
bright peroxide blonde yeah yeah like sort of fifa pro clubs hairstyle i think because now he's got australian fast bowler from the 70s you're, i mean we actually had a comment on youtube last week about the fact that they're both clean shaven which was nice um but you are i sadly my beard game is is bad is, is aggressively bad whereas you mm. you've proven yourself in the past to have quite a good beard game so i would like if you like what lewis looks like i think live it okay be a, be a tash guy could do yeah thanks uh mickey uh, on the YouTube channel. Nice to see such tidy and clean shaven men. I disagree. Let's get you, let's get some fuzz in your face. The YouTube comments are, uh, they're, they are a different beast entirely. Um, where next? Well, I'll tell you where next. Mansfield again, because uh, they're going really well. <laughs> so we barely spoke about it. It was, their, it was their first clean sheet of the season, which, I mean, I'm not necessarily putting down to their own improvement defensively because Northampton had plenty of chances even outside of the um, penalty. But, they're like a real sort of neutral's choice at the moment, Mansfield. Their games are very open, um, lots of chances at either end. Uh, Will Evans doing well up, up at the top of the pitch with Gregory as well. Um, good to see after the departure of Keylord Dunn, I think had a few Stags fans a bit scared that they'd be blunted, but no. No. Uh, Reading 2, Huddersfield 1. Since Huddersfield beat Bolton 4-0 in that game that we thought signalled maybe the end of Ian Ebert and maybe the introduction of Huddersfield as a potentially a title challenger um, Huddersfield have lost at home to Northampton they lost at home to Blackpool in midweek and then they lost here at Reading as well what's going on big concerns about the defeats that came off the back of the Bolton game this was a bit different where Huddersfield went ahead early in the game through Pearson um, scoring a rebound and then Reading would just ultimately very 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 clinical with Harvey Nibs scoring one of their two shots in the first half the other being an attempt from Lewis Wing from absolutely miles out in a different postcode um, and then in the second half they go ahead through Elliot scoring from a decent finish from just outside the box and Huddersfield create the better chances later on in that half and they can't get over the line like I have sat here a few times over the last couple of weeks and spoken about how much respect I have for Ruben Sellers and for Reading and what he's doing and even if you ignore what's going on off the pitch, which we shouldn't do, but just look at the performances themselves, I think Reading are a good side. However, Reading have played much better than they played on Saturday and have lost games this season already. It was by no means a vintage display from them. Um, Huddersfield were, were much improved from what we've seen previously and were just unable to to get the ball in the back of the net at times where it mattered. So, um, obviously, big concerns about Huddersfield at the moment. To have lost three games in a row is a worry and it doesn't really help them that their next game is away at Birmingham um, because it might be early days but if, if Huddersfield have genuine top two aspirations then they're going to have got to try and get something off Birmingham on Tuesday night um, but I, I, I'm i not quite you know I'm not writing them off yet I do think there was Saturday was just one of those days where when things aren't going your way sometimes you put in an approved performance and you still don't get anything out of it. And in the 18th minute, uh, Reading fans holding up red cards with Die Family Sell Reading FC in English and also in, in Mandarin. Um, that got some coverage over the weekend. Uh, A.D. Williams talking really passionately on Sky Sports about it. Uh, also Henry Winter uh, sharing um, his thoughts on the situation as well as we try and sort of try and raise awareness in order to help in any way that, that we can we being neutrals that, that want to see this situation resolved as soon as possible. The the idea behind the red cards um, and the writing of the message in Mandarin is that the Reading fans and the uh, fan protest group Sell Before We Die um, are trying to get the message out in the Chinese media just as a means to try and get into Dai Yong and communicate with him and, and lead to him understanding what needs to be done, um, which is is absolutely paramount at the moment. Um, Stevenage beat Charlton 1-0. Um, great goal to win it as well, where um, Stevenage keeper catches a set piece and rolls it into the path of Roberts, who's off and running. Roberts carries it uh, almost the whole pitch, and then when he's about 35 yards out, floats across to the back post. The ball is then cut back first time on the volley by his uh, attacking partner. And then Roberts finishes it off on the edge of the six-yard box, having sprinted inside the box. So he didn't just stand and admire his lovely lofted pass to the back post. He busted gut to get inside the box and he benefited and scored the winner. Um, this game also saw an incredible Piagiani clearance off the line, yeah. which helped 
Stevenage keep what is their fifth clean sheet already this season, which is pretty remarkable and reflects very well on Alex Ravel and his coaching staff, how they've been able to coach this team uh, out of possession. Charlton fans not very happy here. Poor performances in the last couple of weeks. Those early season wins that they were grinding out have ground to a halt. And in this game, as they have done quite regularly, just making chance creation look very, very difficult in a way that does surprise and disappoint, given you know Nathan Jones in the dugout and the players that they have on the pitch as well. Four draws in League One. We had Barnsley 1, Stockport 1 on Sky on Saturday night. Lots of incident, really entertaining uh, League One fair uh, live on the box and a late, late equaliser from a star of the league, Louis Barry, uh, after Adam Phillips had put Barnsley ahead from the spot. 1-1 one, one there and at Shrewsbury where Rotherham cancelled out Shrews' first half goal from George Lloyd with a penalty of their own. Johnson, Clark, Harris equalising off the bench for them and 2-0-0 nil, nil draws, Leighton Orient nil, Wrexham nil. Basically, two major incidents here was Charlie Kelman putting one wide when through on goal in the first half and then Wrexham in the second half had one incident where they had two or three shots, a bit of a goal mouth scramble from a set piece but the ball uh, not going into the net. 0-0 nil, nil there and at Wick, Wigan against Exeter. Wigan are a team that happened. Unbelievable. Every game. Three nil nils in a row. <laughs> Every game Latins. just happens. <laughs> to be fair, they did dominate this game. They had six shots on target to Exeter's none. Uh, and Whitworth in goal for Exeter was the reason why this wasn't a Wigan W. We were one game short in League Two. That's because Wimbledon and Accrington's game did not go ahead. You'll have all seen the scenes at Wimbledon after that rain early last week. And it means that their game against Accrington was postponed. It meant that their cup game against Newcastle was knocked back a week. That'll be played on Tuesday night up in Newcastle. And that means that the scheduled League Two game against Crewe will also be pushed back. So Wimbledon, such an impressive start to the season. How could this have happened? It's really difficult to get your head around um, and really disappointing for the club because I think everyone knows, outside of the, the financial um, hit that they will take from, from match day revenue and things like that, uh, I think just the fact of having two games to make up in what is already a busy schedule is, is not going to be very helpful. Um, at the top of the table for the second week in a row, we had first v second and it was Gillingham against Barrow and just like last week George it was Jill's what won it to nil mm. win to Nillingham <clears throat> Forcefield FC yeah um, but this was good I mean again they, they, they put in a very good display um, we spoken in the pod before about teams against Gillingham struggling to convert chances this time around though it was rather than their wasteful finishing and missing the target um, it was Glenn Morris who made a couple of really important saves, especially at 1-0. Mm. Um, Clark opened the scoring with a really nicely taken goal. Someone who's obviously in, you know, if you look at form players in League 2 right now, um, he's certainly one of those. And then McKenzie, albeit, I mean, this is a, it's an own goal, isn't it? It's an own goal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, McKenzie but has been given the goal Very clearly an own goal as well. Yes. Even to the extent that <laughs> commentator said on the highlight show, uh, this is an own goal that's been given to McKenzie. So like, I think... We've talked about it before where you get because the dubious goals panel doesn't actually exist, like unless do you think, unless do you think like, we could pitch for being it? Yes, and then we just on Mondays we just say who scored. That would be great. Yeah, um, there are you get these scenarios where like the defender doesn't want an own goal to be attributed no. to him, and Mackenzie would love to have. A if he's listening. He's him. like, shut up. So they just they just like everyone just agrees. <clears> Everyone's sort of murder. Just like don't talk about it. I know people out there who backed you know anytime goal scorer, last goal scorer. Think how lucky you are there. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, it's good. And, and it kind of feels like Gillingham, Gillingham's performance levels are improving week on week. Um, as we've discussed, like the ball is going to go in their net fairly soon, but it didn't happen here up against the Barrow side who've been, been brilliant. You know, Stephen Clements would have gone to Priestfield as Barrow manager, hoping to kind of rub it in the faces of his old employer, but, um, it's kind of happened the other way around. Um, they host Grimsby tomorrow night. Um, who we'll talk about shortly. Um, but, you know, right now, Gillingham are bookies' favourites with most firms to, to win the league. And given their results, you can understand why. Good time to play Barrow in that they had been to Stamford Bridge to play Chelsea in the midweek. They're also missing Canavan 
and Farman, two very important players for them, senior players, centre-back and goalkeeper. And they're both out for, I think, between a month and two months as well. So, you know, what a start to the season for Barrow, in particular defensively. How much will that uh, impact what they're able to do in terms of clean sheets going forward? If it does have a negative impact on them, they're going to need to find ways of, of uh, troubling the opposition a little more frequently going forward. Um, what about Walsall? They beat uh, Colu 4-0. Uh, last week, I mentioned on the pod that Colchester had had the most shots on target in the whole EFL. Uh, didn't have a single one against Walsall, which feels um, pretty typical. And their defensive stats are so absurd right now, uh, to the point where Matt, who's a Walsall fan on NTT20 squad, said, I'm now so obsessed with our numbers that I spent the whole game not only hoping the opposition didn't score, but petrified we might concede a shot on target <laughs> or a decent XG opportunity to ruin our data. I needn't have worried. It is it is just incredible. Like they are they are so good. Um and the defensive numbers are so impressive. Where even though here they conceded eleven shots, none on target, um, an XG of, of zero point six according to Fotmob. It's just, you know, they're they're gonna concede some goals, but you know, compare it to, for example, Gillingham, who are avoiding the issue in a different way. For for Walsall, they just go into every game with an incredible platform where like it feels really unlikely that they're gonna concede two goals in a game it feels fairly unlikely they're going to concede a solitary goal and you know to add to that they're, they're, they're not too bad from an attacking standpoint as well um jealous with a beautifully taken first a kind of a, a flying first touch as the ball came over his shoulder and then and then a good finish uh and then they kind of rode it out pretty comfortably with sort of better side in the second half before uncle albert uh adoma with 10 minutes to go uh, made it 2-0 and then earring um having a Having a um, a good time late on with it with a couple of, of late goals to kind of give the scoreline a bit of a gloss at the end. So. People comparing Jealous's first touch to Dennis Burkamp's first touch, which I think does... Isn't that you rather than people? No, that wasn't me. Oh. How far behind are you in Not the Top 20's history that you still think I do all the tweets? No, I thought, I thought you'd do some of them. <laughs> and that was one I thought might have been you. I was I was at a wedding on Saturday. I was in absolutely no state to be calling yeah, that's right. Dennis Jealous or whatever they... <laughs> Jealous Burkamp. <laughs> Dennis <laughs> Jealous. <laughs> Jealous, Je- Dennis Jealous. <laughs> oh my god, that would make no sense. Jealous Bergkamp. Jealous Bergkamp. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Well, I, I think that's a poor comparison because obviously Burkham didn't mean his first good first touch. Jealous definitely meant this one. Yeah, and also they were very different first touches. Yes, and that. Um, mate, Walsall's keeper has only had to make. 12 saves in eight games so far um it's it's quite remarkable there's there's one thing that's worth saying about Walsall because obviously we're getting a bit a bit carried away they haven't played anyone in the top half of the table yet Walsall so they have proven themselves to be absolutely excellent against a bunch of teams that so far this season haven't been absolutely excellent whereas Gillingham have played five teams in the current top 10 so fixture difficulty wise Jill's um, have had it much, much tougher. Doncaster Chesterfield felt like a big one um, pre-match and it was quite a big result and a lot of incident in it. Chesterfield winning 3-0 at Donny, uh, going ahead through a Shea Dunkley header, scoring a second through a Paddy Madden penalty, scoring a third when Berry nice little nutmeg and then a, a lovely little finish from the edge of the box. And that is ignoring what were the main talking points after the game, which were all referee-based. Uh, firstly... Doncaster didn't think that it was a foul for the free kick that led to Dunkley putting Chesterfield ahead. They also had, off the back of that, Lee Molyneux, as they walked off the pitch for half-time, booked for dissent, presumably talking about the free kick they didn't think should have been given in the build-up to Dunkley's. That was quite important because in the second half, Molyneux was played through. He was flagged offside a few seconds after you'd normally expect to see a flag. That made everyone pretty upset including Luke Molyneux, who then took a touch, having looked, having turned, looked at the ref, acknowledged that he'd blown up, and then just scored. I think that's the essential point of that, is with that one, it, it's totally Molyneux's fault, and I yep. don't think anyone can have any issue at all with him being sent off. No, and, and they didn't. It's that sort of, it's that anger at the ref, which you can still find a way to like somehow blame the referee, while also acknowledging that Molyneux's just been quite thick there. Um, Grant McCann, in fairness, made that point pretty well. Uh, and then uh, down to nine men later in the game when uh, Tom Anderson had a tangle with D- Dunkley off camera and got sent off, uh, which was spotted by the uh, linesman. The, it was kind of one of those weird ones where the ref ends up like stopping an attack 
and sending on sending off someone that had been nowhere near it and you yeah. didn't really understand what's happened but um helped out by his lino there so um tough one for, for donny great one for chesterfield feels like they've been on the other end of some of those games recently where and they've not got the the results necessarily that they felt they deserved. They got it there. Uh, Donny played Barrow on Tuesday night, uh, obviously with those suspensions of Molyneux and Anderson, with the injuries that I mentioned for Barrow. We'll see who who copes better with those absences. Another away win was Grimsby, beating Carlisle from behind <clears throat> by three goals to two. Yeah, it's kind of set piecey this one, wasn't it? Mm. Really. Um, it's interesting because so you've got two managers here in Mike Williamson and David Artell, both of whom I think have shown a, the potential to be like top level managers. Well, you know, I say top level. It wouldn't surprise me if either of these two managers are, are, are in charge of a championship side in the future, given what Williamson did over a very short space of time at MK Dons last season and that incredible crew team that, that David Artell built. However, both of them are kind of on their haunches right now with Williamson's first full season charge of MK Dons only lasting about five matches before he left without MK Dons fans really caring that he was leaving going to Carlisle and for Artel you know it's coming up to a year now that he's been in charge at Grimsby Town and even though the I think the fan base are relatively happy and the football is pretty good results wise things haven't really changed at all despite a big churn of, of players um, and I think this is a, a significant win for, for Grimsby especially coming from behind away from home at a team, I guess you should have their tails up after landing a, a bit of a coup and bring, bring Williamson in. So, um, it's significant for them. I think for, for Carlisle at the moment, they have to work, you know, it's it's early enough in the season, there will still be hopes that they can force their way into, a, you know, the conversation for the top seven. But right now, they need to get some points on the board pretty quickly because there aren't that many poor teams in League Two and they're sitting in, in 22nd position after eight games on six points. Um, and to throw away a 2-1 advantage um you know, they, they led this game 2-1 from the 27th minute and to concede two headers direct from corners from Cass and Rogers, you can't really do that, frankly. Um, and the only last thing I have to say about this is how much I absolutely loved the fact that Harvey Rogers, the centre-back, nodded it in in the 90th minute and Kinsman did just straight, hey. shirt straight over his head and, just, and it also what's funny is he didn't even go very far he just <laughs> he pulled amazing. his shirt straight over his face yeah. ran about 10 steps and then just kind of stood there with his shirt still over his head yeah probably worried he's gonna get booked whatever. yeah it's, we we are in so many ways way too similar yeah my note here really nice 90s shirt overhead celebration well, interestingly <laughs> he wasn't booked well he didn't take a shirt off i know but i just i, I reckon it's a perfect crime I, I agree so i think we know that there are a few players out there mm-hmm that listen to this pod. Yeah. Maybe not the way down to League Two, but hopefully they do. <laughs> what? So I think if you're if you're an EFL player, listen to the pod. Next time you score, can you please do do the Rogers? So you, and then, then we can know. Unwittingly, you've introduced a theory that a League Two player would be less likely to listen to the pod than a Championship. Not a League player, Two player, just which you said maybe not all the way down to League yeah, Two. Yeah, because if you think about the whereas I think a League the, Two player would be more likely no, to listen to this pod because there's so little League Two coverage. I said, out I, said there. I said EFL player more likely. Right to hear us talk about your 90s so, goal so, celebration. So the smorgasbord of um, players who listen to this mm. should be scattered through Championship League 1 and League 2. And, yeah. if, and so if we have more Championship League 1, then they may have turned off for League 2. Uh, That's what I mean. I mean. But, yeah, please, if you listen to the pod, can you do the, the Rogers next time you score? Do the Rogers. Also, if you listen to the pod and you're a current EFL professional footballer, yeah. can you, like, DM us on Instagram or something so that we know? All right. Because it's hard for them to come out of the woodwork sometimes I think they're scared of admitting but it but we often meet them and they're like I listen yeah well we can't name names can we? can't both be true they're, they're either lying to us or <laughs> yeah or they're in the in the shadows it'd be, yeah it'd be weird if a couple of them that messed us again being like hi lads I, I've already told you this but I, I do listen also if we know that you're listening exponentially more likely to like do a really nice interview where we have a great chat and everyone yeah. wins yeah including the audience uh, Cheltenham nil, Fleetwood 2 should have been two wins in the week for Fleetwood because we all watched that game on Monday night against Morecambe. They were 2 0 up and it looked like they were cruising until a remarkable Morecambe comeback uh, finished off with a Hallam Hope sort of pecking one in, uh, which was quite impressive. Um, but Fleetwood getting the win here, um, Cheltenham giving them a big old helping hand with Scott Bennett in particular. Uh, getting caught on the ball, uh, Virtue benefiting with the first goal and scoring a really nice one as well uh, for his second for a 2-0 win for Fleetwood. Looking very much the better side. Now, 
you are still very high on Fleetwood. I maybe for devil's advocate purposes want to point out that I think this might be as much to do with Cheltenham being really poor. Um, they had only sh six shots total in this game, only one on target. And seven or eight games in, I can't see anything that Cheltenham are good at, consistently so. Um, in attack, they're not particularly good in terms of their possession play or building through the thirds. They're not very good on the counter-attack. When they play direct, that's not going particularly well. Um, they're not a massive threat from set pieces, although they've had a few opportunities so far this season and, and obviously one of their wins came with a set piece winner from um late doors from Bradbury um they don't have much of a threat in behind not much pace at the top of the pitch don't think when it comes to crossing they've offered a huge threat albeit I will admit that pain is quite lively down the right hand side they don't have any particularly creative passes either so I'm still yet to put my finger on what Cheltenham are doing well consistently and that is a concern and that was definitely the case here. Uh, what about Harrogate 2, Bradford 1, George? Harrogate adding Bradford to their list of Yorkshire conquests after beating Donny the other day as well. I feel like Harrogate have a... I mean, this is just anecdotal off the top of my head, but Harrogate have a very good uh, record in this fixture. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like they quite often upset their bigger neighbours. Um, and you could... It's rare that you can hear really loud booing and you know it's the away end um, in a game. But that's what happened here with Dooley and Taylor scoring to put Harrogate 2 up uh, after 20 minutes or so. I think when I, wouldn't, I won't be alone that when Andy Cook scored to make it 2-1, I probably thought Bradford would come back into this and, and at least get a point. But they were unable to, um, despite completely dominating the second half of this game um, with having all the ball and you know, understandably Harrogate basically sitting in and looking to, to defend their lead. Despite that, um, Bradford weren't able to to um to score a, an equaliser. So after what was a very good start to the season, Bradford's fortunes tailing off a little bit. And after what was a pretty concerning start to the season for Harrogate, um, they picked up a couple of pretty impressive scalps in in Donny and Bradford. Yeah, Bradford missing three senior centre backs at the moment, which has led to Graham Alexander switching from the, the kind of three five two shape that that they've recruited for to a four four two. Uh, which looks predictably quite awkward and, and not looking great. They've now lost three away league, game, league games in a row. Uh, one of my favourite assists of the weekend, actually, was Daly for uh, Harrogate's second goal. Where you like, you don't see wingers do this very often. And I think my theory is because if it, if it doesn't work, it looks really bad. Where he received the ball right out on the touchline. And with his first touch, he knocked it around the defender and was so the defender was so surprised and Daly's acceleration was so good that he then ran round him, got on the ball, cut it back, and Ellis Taylor finished it. I think my theory is that like why do you not see more wingers try this move where basically the first touch is to knock is to like properly knock it round the defender. I think it's because if you don't get the ball on the other side, it just looks really wasteful. <laughs> yeah. It feels like a bit of an old school move. Mm. You know there's been a lot of talk at the moment as to like do teams actually shoot less than they used to? Yeah. I reckon if you did a bit of analysis on it, do wingers try and knock the ball past their man and run around them? Yeah. The answer would be they do it less. Do you reckon now. that was what Stanley Matthews did a lot? I can't say I've seen much of Stan, if oh, I'm going to be honest. No, all right. That's why I'm asking. I don't know. But he was called the dribble wizard, wasn't he? Uh, then probably, yeah. I'm the, sure that's The what wizard king. Yeah. One of the two. The No but point it, being a wizard king, is there? That, that, then there's no, um, no inference of dribbling there. That's just a wizard king. There's nothing to do with football. That's something very different. Dribble yeah. wizard or dribble king. Probably makes more sense. Yeah. Great player. Um, Port Vale beat Swindon 2-1. And I think Vale are going to start putting together a decent couple of months here. Just kind of think they're getting in rhythm. And I like Darren Moore teams in rhythm when he's got good players. And he's got good players here. I uh, actually made a, a couple of changes for the first time in a couple of games um, and it worked pretty well. Um, they've got a real set piece threat, Hall and Hennigan, the centre-backs being the main targets. But then when you've got your secondary threats, Garrity who scored two against Salford from set pieces early in the season and then Byers here with a flying header um, to put them in front. You've got a real threat from those situations and they get good delivery as well. And then Brandon Cover with his first senior goal, uh, right wing back on loan from Leicester. Um, he tackled the defender nutmeg the defender and dinked it over the keeper and it was all pretty cool and quite fun um and uh will Wright free kick 
meant that Swindon pulled one back late on, but only had four shots total in this game. Um, Drynan hitting the post on the counter, but I think on balance of play, no real debate here. Vale fairly dominant and getting the win, and I think showing some quite good signs. At Newport needed a win after three defeats in a row, and Crew having won four games in a row before this one, they didn't need a win. Um, <laughs> They'd like to win that. And their winning streak has now been snapped. Snapped? By Newport. Uh, yeah. A big result this for Newport, you have to say, because things were getting pretty concerning in terms of their attacking output and their ability to, to even fashion goals and opportunities, let alone take them. Um, but they were able to, to come away from this one with, with all three points. Uh, the first goal coming courtesy of Cameron Evans with his first goal in English football and it was a good one as well a long range strike into the top corner um, and Crew, you know we said it about um, Reading earlier where I feel like Crew have put in some pretty ropey performances recently where they've uh, come away with all three points but in this case you know they they put the pressure on Newport they were able to to, to create a fair bit and when uh, Thibaut scored the, the equaliser it was uh, deserved and again like a lot of other games we discussed, it kind of felt like from there you probably expect Crew to go on and 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 look to win the game. But it was um, it was Baker who scored the the winner for Newport, and you know for for Jardim, the new manager at Newport, given the way that things have gone recently after a pretty promising start, um, you know if you look down towards the bottom end of League Two, Morecambe and Accrington are the, are the two favourites for relegation, and you can understand why, especially with Accrington really struggling to to um well they haven't won a game yet this season and are struggling to kind of get any points on the board whatsoever and um, with the two relegation spots there you know for teams like Cheltenham and Newport I think even at this stage now it's just a case of like we have to make sure that we try and put a buffer between us and those teams we've just mentioned um and and therefore every three points is absolutely essential because you know it's it doesn't feel like there are going to be that many wins on the horizon for, for a couple of other teams down there. Yeah, and Thibaut is uh, the name that you mentioned. He scored his first goal for Crew in this game. It was his first uh, Lee, it was his yeah EFL debut goal. He'd had one disallowed already before then. Uh, he's already scored in the um, Bristol Street Paint Motors Pizza John, John's. Trophy, John's. Um, and uh, a goal here as well. So looking quite lively. And we might see a bit more of him because... Uh, Long and Bogle, and then in this game, Hemmings coming off as well, uh, all suffering with injuries at the moment. Thibaut's a 20-year-old um, Irish player who was with Cobra Ramblers before, then seems to have come over to England at the start of this year and spent a while looking for a, a sort of um, a permanent home. He played for Macclesfield for like a month or two, uh, and then he went out on loan uh, from... Oh no, then he left Macclesfield and played for Bradford Park Avenue, towards the end of last season uh, and then joined Crew after an extended trial over the summer. So 20-year-old striker, uh, keep an eye on Adrian Thibault of Crew. Um, Bromley drew one all with MK Dons and what I'd like to know from you, George, much more than anything about the game itself, is do you think Scott Lindsay is a good appointment for MK Dons? I think this is one of the hardest questions to answer um, because... There is no denying how incredible a job he did last season at Crawley Town, where I cannot remember, like possibly Wagner's Huddersfield, but even then, like I can't remember a team so aggressively unfancied to start a season, so routinely written off, going on and winning a promotion off the back of that. Like it is, and it, it gets forgotten just how much Crawley Town were unquestionably the team that everyone thought was going to get relegated to non league. And he has to be the the most important person or or the the biggest driver of that success. So on that note, you're like, well, that's incredible. Like, you know, obviously it's an amazing appointment. However, you have, you know, the, the Swindon tenure, I think you can kind of write off. And also the fact that they were actually, I think, seventh or eighth in the league when he, when he went to, so it wasn't like he was doing a particularly bad job, albeit, Weirdly enough, the Swindon fans didn't seem to buy into him, which seems strange because he seems like a someone who really worked hard with Crawley to, to build a relationship with the fan base. Um, but also didn't really appreciate the style of football, which is, again is quite weird because the, the football we saw at Crawley was eminently enjoyable, even when not successful. But the biggest question mark here is that in, in MK Dons, you have, to, from what we know, one of the mo most data literate um, clubs in the EFL, or at least in League Two. 
and they have hired a manager whose success has basically come from one of the weirdest statistical quirks we've seen covering the EFL, where their over achievement compared to the expected goals, the ridiculous goal uh, shot stopping numbers that Corey Adai put up in a season that I just can't imagine we'll ever see again. Like fundamentally, you can talk about and you know, and also Orsi's finishing spree. Like, you know, you can talk about the style of play and that he gets it and everything else. But frankly, if Corey Adai has a shot stopping season that is on par with the average, Crawley don't finish in the top seven and probably end up finishing somewhere in kind of the the bottom half. So I think I'm on the fence. I think I really want it to work. I think it'll be very entertaining. I think there's also a big case here where Lindsay was given a squad expected to to be relegated and MK Dons, he is going to be given a squad who are capable of performances, like way clear of of what that Crawley squad squad should have been capable with. And if he's able to elevate them just a little bit, then that that should be enough. So TBC, I'm excited to see. Like it's going to be an interesting case study to see how you know the in, both jobs are getting a team out of League Two, but it feels like there are massive differences in terms of the tools at their disposal to do mm. so. Um, but I'm excited to see it. Yeah, Morecambe drew one all with with Notts County. Angle putting them ahead, cancelled out by Matt Platt. Both keepers are making some quite big saves in this game. Um, and the news from Notts is that Jody Jones, unfortunately, is injured again. Uh, thankfully, it is not a recurrence of the ACL injuries that have plagued him previously. Um, it's a, a, a breaking of a bone in his leg, but um, it should be something that only keeps him out for maybe a couple of months, maybe until the new year, rather than... Um, something horrendous and, and season ending. Uh, Tramier nil, Salford nil on Friday night was a match that happened. Join us for Under the Lights on NTT20.com. That will be our new uh, podcast covering the midweek fixtures that take place on Tuesday night. It'll be out by Wednesday lunchtime. And if you're a paid subscriber of NTT20.com, which you can sign up to for £7 a month or £72 a year if, if you want a discount, um, then you'll be able to listen to that. And it will be, I reckon, Really great for you to listen to. So please do join us on ntt20.com and again on Thursday as well for a betting show ahead of the weekend. Cheers. Go out.